Good afternoon. Three years back, I reflected on how compassion and business can be combined to transform the lives of the disabled. And I'm here to share this story with you today. When I looked at the disability statistics, it stunned me. Globally, one out of every seven in the world are disabled. In India, the country where I live, census shows a population of 20 million. However, World Bank reports and others state the actual number may be something like 60 to 70 million. I began my career as a private sector person, moved on to business journalism. But sometimes I would wander to the villages to look at the lives of the poor, the unempowered. I reached a point in my life where it was just not enough to capture these stories through words and on camera. I just felt compelled to do something. This began my 10-year-long journey with rural and tribal youth. And three years back, I started Youth for Jobs, which works with the even more vulnerable young men and women with disability, locomotor disability, hearing impaired, and low vision. It trains them, it empowers them, and most importantly, it links them to companies and jobs. In the last three years, we have touched 100,000 households and work with about 200 companies. I enjoy telling stories, real stories. So let me begin with the story of Renuka. Renuka was bright, so she studied school and college through scholarships. But everything was a struggle for her accessing toilets, going to the classrooms, because none of the facilities was disabled-friendly. After this struggle, she still remained unemployed. Ma'am, she said, people kept looking at my disability and not my abilities. She came to us, her English improved, and most importantly, her self-confidence grew. Today, Renuka works in Bank of America, earning a princely sum, at least 10 times that of her parents. When a young woman is disabled in the villages of India, she's considered a burden and a curse. So to really understand the achievements of Renuka, our trainers and alumni, you have to understand where they come from. She's cursed and blamed but quite often, disability is not her fault. Her mother may not have eaten nutritious food, so she's born with a birth defect, or it could be the malfunctioning of the health center. Young women tell me, ma'am, I was born with my arms and legs working. One day, I had high fever. My father carried me to the nearest health center. The doctor there gave an injection. By the time I reached home, my arms and legs had stopped working. A young woman in a village with disability has four burdens on her shoulders. She's disabled, she's isolated, she's jobless, and she's poor. And when we tell parents that this very same young woman can actually earn and be independent, parents shake their heads with disbelief. Parents are mostly marginal farmers, earning about $30 a month, or sometimes hire themselves out for a daily wage. They quite often make the long journey from the village to our city office to check out if we are for real. When we began the work, we were surrounded by cans. Parents said can, companies said can, the youth themselves said can. So we worked to convert those cans to can. It was not easy, let me tell you. We really struggled. But we knew 
that giving one job to one member of the family takes the entire family out of poverty in a sustained manner. We also believed that every one of them had potential. We were only facilitators to bring out their own inner power. So we pushed ahead. We understood trainings of non-disabled. We had to deepen our understanding of disability. Disability is spelt as one word, but there's a range of disability. In one year, we created a template which can be scaled across anywhere with some customization. We began with one training center. Today, we have 16. We started in one state of India. Today, we are nine. We set up our training centers when the local community invited us. Thus, the work became very demand-driven. In three years, we touched 100,000 households, trained 5,600 young men and women, 70% of them got jobs, and I'm really happy to tell you, 40% of them are young women. So you may ask me, what were your challenges, and how did you overcome them? Challenge one was improving self-esteem. The young men and women who came to our trainings had incredibly low self-esteem. In fact, sometimes they would sit silent in the class for the first week. So we appointed young men and women with disability themselves to go out into the villages to speak to the village postmaster, the teacher, the parents, and say that, hey, change is possible. Please enroll your sons and daughters into these new kinds of training. So our work became uniquely of the disabled by the disabled. Our challenge, too, was to design these new kinds of trainings. We worked, struggled, and created a three-month residential employment-linked trainings, which were in two parts. One was generic modules to improve English speaking, computer literacy, because a lot of them had never touched a computer before, motivational games, interviewing skills, and yoga. It was a fun-filled curriculum Perhaps it gave them a childhood they never had. For example, we taught them English through inspirational songs like, We Shall Overcome. <laughs> if you listen, it does not sound like English because of their accents. But for them, every word mattered. Then we went out to the companies and asked them, Hey, what is it that you want? What is it you expect from your employees? We listened to them and co-created curriculums in industries like retail, IT, hospitality, banking, where the jobs are. Our special needs instructors understood disability, but had absolutely no idea of the world of business. We worked to change that. But soon we realized it was not enough to change our students, our trainers. We had to change the mindsets of companies. And that became our challenge three. Companies really feared the unknown. What will happen to our non-disabled workforce, they asked us. Can we hire and fire? Can they actually work? So, we designed company sensitization workshops for the CEOs, for the managers, for the supervisors. We did one for Google on their request in Diversity Week. This led to a request for a sign language workshop, and now hiring. And we told companies not to hire these youth because it's a nice thing to do not to do it out of sympathy, but to hire, because 
It's a right thing to do from their own business perspective. These youth were tremendously loyal and productive. And slowly, companies responded. A French automotive giant asked us to help them build an inclusive workforce. So we mapped the jobs, did simple workplace adaptations, like a red light for emergencies for our hearing impaired youth. The CEO was stepping into his car when he saw the parents of the newly hired youth. He heard their moving stories. Youth with qualifications, but no jobs, merely because of their disability. He came back in, called me and said, hey, Meera, this is incredibly good karma. <laughs> but soon he realized it was not just good karma. When they measured productivity three months later, our youth were 15% more productive than the others. And today, we are dialoguing on how to take this work across all their plants. In a gems and jewelry factory, we placed one. Today, there are 500 young men and women with disability, and every year, our youth win the Best Employee of the Year Award. My husband used to work with UNESCO in Italy. Friends constantly asked me, what was I doing wandering in the villages of India when I should be relaxing on the gondolas of Venice? <laughs> they kept asking me, what keeps you doing this kind of work? What keeps me going is the story of Malika and others like her. When I spoke to Malika, she told me she had paid back her father's high-interest loan of $6,600. In India, the poor borrow at a high interest rate of about 30%, and this puts them into a permanent debt trap. She had paid back this money, and she was educating her younger brothers and sisters. And she told me with a big smile that she had carried back the first large colored television of her village. <laughs> and sometimes we just enjoy, because there's romance in the air. Ishwarama and Sudhakar, two of our alumni, got married. <laughs> and today, they are what you and I describe as a double income family. <laughs> so, when a young woman in a village gets a job, disability no longer matters. Overnight, the equations change. She becomes the only one in her family who brings money day in and day out. The only one in her family who sends money if her mother or grandmother falls ill who educates her younger brother, even if she's less educated, and who walks proudly in a village with her new uniform, inspiring others to be like her and independent. And these same young men and women will get married, will give their children better health, better education, and leave behind and ensure a better world, a better tomorrow. Our young men and women from India could not be here today, but they wanted to share with you their happiness in their new independence on screen. The same happiness I feel every day in this challenging but magical work. <laughs>